if these images of Palestinian casualties in Gaza keep coming out, the likelihood of Hezbollah getting involved is quite significant. And there's also the possibility of a multi-front war. So that's what we're facing right now. A dearth of leadership, a dearth of wisdom, and people resorting to military means to solve problems that have no military solution. Most of the nuclear nations now are not going to be decreasing the number of nuclear weapons. They're going to be increasing them. All nine nuclear powers are modernizing their nuclear arsenal. There are currently close to 13,000 nuclear weapons, and most are between seven and 80 times as powerful as the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. There are many people in the West who see this as an opportunity to destroy the Iranian leadership. We know that there have been such plans in the past, and some of them, we're told, involve the use of nuclear weapons. We've got four countries, we've got about 2,000 nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. The US, Russia, France, and Britain all have nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert right now. So right now, there are two people who've got veto power over the future existence of life on our planet, Putin uh, and Biden. But it looks like Xi Jinping wants to enter that club also. 700 attacks by Israeli settlers on Palestinian this year alone in the West Bank. You know, and the world has turned a blind eye to this. Hi, you're watching Hindustan Times in Focus, and I'm Aditi Prasad. And joining me is Peter Kuznick. He's a professor of history and director of Nuclear Studies Institute at the American University. Mr. Kuznick, uh, I was reading an interview of yours uh, a short while from now, uh, from, from now, and I was actually scared, scared about where the world is going. Uh, I was scared for humanity. And uh, because you've warned of a nuclear winter and an Armageddon, a nuclear Armageddon uh, in the in the in the coming. There's Russia-Ukraine war. There is uh, the tensions over Taiwan, and of course now this is the latest uh, Israel-Hamas war, which is playing out in the Middle East and is threatening to engulf the entire region as well as the world. Um, how how serious do you think the situation is? I, th I think it's very 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 serious. We can't underestimate how dangerous this present moment is and also how historically unprecedented this is. I mean, we're the, we could maybe trace it back to 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis as the last time the world was this close to World War III and potential nuclear war. Uh, but we've never quite seen anything like this. The three crisis areas that you just mentioned any one of them could explode. Most immediately now, the situation in the Middle East or Southwest Asia, as many people refer to it, uh, the uh, United States has got two aircraft carrier strike groups in the region with nuclear weapons on board. Putin has recently talked about the fact that he's deploying MiG-31 bombers carrying Kinzhal missile systems, hypersonic missile systems, uh, effectively monitoring the U.S. deployment in the Mediterranean. Uh, and it's a situation where if these images of Palestinian casualties in Gaza keep coming out, the likelihood of Hezbollah getting involved is quite significant. And there's also the possibility of a multi-front war going on. What does Israel do if there's a multi-front war? if it feels that its existence is threatened. It's got a nuclear arsenal that it's willing to use under extreme circumstances. Plus the United States is very likely to get involved. So the, the danger, and then, then the danger of this, if there's a nuclear exchange, it probably starts off with a small nuclear exchange of tactical weapons. But the studies over the years show that it's almost impossible to limit this kind of nuclear exchange. So it might start small, but then where does it stop? They almost are never able, when they do the war games on this, to stop it before it turns into a full-scale nuclear holocaust. So that's what we're facing right now, a dearth of leadership, a dearth of wisdom, and 
people resorting to military means to solve problems that have no military solution. Who can bring about an end to this bloodshed that is going on across the world? You talked about wisdom. Whose wisdom? Which leadership? Well, the, the only people who have been speaking for the world lately, really, are Guterres at the United Nations, occasionally the Pope, uh, sometimes Lula from Brazil has had some wisdom. Uh, but most of the leaders, uh, Modi wants to make India great again. Putin wants to make Russia great again. Xi wants to make China great again. Biden wants to make America great again. What we need is people to speak for the planet. Well, our planet is suffering now. It's fragile. It's damaged. And instead, people are, we see increasing arsenals. Most of the nuclear nations now are not going to be decreasing the number of nuclear weapons. They're going to be increasing them. All nine nuclear powers are modernizing their nuclear arsenal, making them more efficient and more lethal. We're going the wrong direction on all of this. And we're seeing, you know, these spreading wars. Uh, so I think we're at a, at a crisis point. I would love to see Modi and Xi and Putin and Biden uh, and Lula and, you know, uh, Scholz and others sit down for a global summit to really think about how we begin to walk some of this back and address what the real needs are. We live in a planet in which the richest eight people have more wealth than the poorest four billion people. That's madness. We have the capability for, with the effects of nuclear winter to virtually end all life on the planet. Maybe not everybody, but this possibility exists. We know that even a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were used, could create partial nuclear winter, send 5 million tons of smoke, soot, and debris into the atmosphere, hit the stratosphere, circle the stratosphere within two weeks, block the sun's rays. We have partial ice age temperatures on much many parts of the Earth's surface. And that limited nuclear war could result in between one and two billion people di dying around the planet. Uh, but that's 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons. There are currently close to 13,000 nuclear weapons, and most are between seven and 80 times as powerful as the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. So we face as a global civilization, as a planet, a real crisis now, and we're not dealing with it with the kind of seriousness and leadership that we desperately need. Do you see, do you see the, you know, we know that Israel uh, has nuclear weapons. Yeah. And Iran can develop a weapons-grade plutonium within two weeks, is what we understand. Uh, do you see the Israel, the Middle East conflict turning nuclear? Uh, I see a great, great possibility of this spreading beyond Gaza and Israel and Hamas. Uh, I mean, we see the threats that are coming. We see the statements. There's already fighting going on between Israel and Hezbollah. Hamas is a small and limited military force. Hezbollah is a much more powerful military force. And they've got 150,000 missiles and rockets that they can launch. That would overwhelm Israel's Iron Dome system. That would create tremendous loss of life in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Israel's major cities. How is Israel going to respond to that? How is the United States? We've already seen military exchanges between the United States uh, bombing in, in Syria. Uh, we know that the Iranian, I just saw the Iranian foreign minister again, raising the possibility of this spreading. If Iran gets involved, you know, which is not unlikely in this situation, there are many people in the West who see this as an opportunity to destroy the Iranian leadership. We know that there have been such plans in the past, and some of them, we're told, involve the use of nuclear weapons, because Iran has a lot of very hardened targets that perhaps cannot be destroyed with conventional weapons. So th th these threats exist. It's a real possibility. And before that, we were talking about the danger of nuclear war over Ukraine. And you know, the, United, the Pentagon has run 18 war games, 
about a war between the United States and China over Taiwan. And China's won all 18. We've got Army General Minihan, U.S. Army General, saying he thinks the United States and China are going to be at war by 2025. And we've got people planning for those contingencies. So we've got to find other ways to settle our differences and solve our problems. And what we need is leadership who can see the world through the eyes of their adversaries. Which of the leaders do that? I mean, certainly Biden has not been doing that. Biden has been quite militaristic in his responses. He came to office with 18 top advisors from the Center for a New American Security. These are the hawks. Many of them go are the neocons to trace back to the George W. Bush administration. And so these are not the kind of statesmen and diplomats who see diplomatic solutions. But we should never, the situation in Ukraine should never have begun in the first place. There were diplomatic off-ramps that should have been seized. And we can't make the same mistake over Taiwan now. And we can't allow the situation in the Middle East to, to ex expand, to intensify, to accelerate. I mean, we have to, we need a ceasefire immediately. And we need humanitarian aid to go into Gaza it would be wonderful if we could figure out ways to eliminate the Hamas leadership. What, what Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th was horrific. You know, this is not something we should overlook or dismiss. I um, mean, this kind of behavior cannot be tolerated. But the Israeli response is quite excessive at this point. So you feel the Israeli response is excessive and if the pictures from Gaza keep coming the way they are, uh, the the situation in the world could sort of flare up even more. The configuration will just keep going. Uh, but then in the middle of all this, there are these U.S. bomber planes which are capable of dropping nuclear bombs, which apparently flew very close to Russia's borders. This is according to Moscow. What sort of message does that send according to you? Uh, the message that's being sent now, we've got two aircraft carrier strike groups in the region. Uh, they are preparing for an expanded war. There's approximately 30,000 American troops there. You know, at, at, and then the Russian response, Putin says, this is not a threat. I'm not trying to make a threat, but I want to alert them that we've got these, these bombers in the region on alert carrying these hypersonic uh, missiles that could fly a thousand kilometers. You know, both both sides are upping the postures. We've got four countries. We've got about two thousand nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. The U.S., Russia, France, and Britain all have nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert right now, which meant they're ready for almost immediate use. Uh, I mean, and and we've the amount of time we have. Now that we've gotten rid of almost every arms control treaty, you know, it began with the getting rid of the ABM treaty in 2002, followed by the getting rid of the INF treaty, the Iran nuclear deal, the Open Skies treaty, and we had one treaty left, and that was the New START treaty, and now that's been suspended, which means that every nuclear arms control treaty that we had has now is now non-functional. Or they've been abrogated. So it means we're in a, just a, a crisis moment that is not being treated as a crisis by the world's leaders now. Would you, would you blame, let's say, Russia, uh, Putin, to pull out of the treaty banning nuclear weapons uh, uh, test? What could this lead to? I blame them all. I mean, I think there's there, none of the nuclear powers are showing real leadership. For a long time, China, to its credit, said a very limited arsenal is enough of a deterrent. Uh, and so they limited their nuclear arsenal to about 200 weapons. <clears throat> but now, and because they thought that was sufficient deterrent, and it would be for sane people, but they don't believe that anymore. Now that the tensions have ramped up, especially with the United States, China has increased, apparently, its arsenal to up to 500. China wants, says, at least the Pentagon is alleging, that China plans to have 1,000 by 2030 and 1,500 
by 2035. So right now, there are two people who've got veto power over the future existence of life on our planet, Putin uh, and Biden. But it looks like Xi Jinping wants to enter that club also. And then we can have three people with new power to veto future existence of life on the planet. I mean, what, what's the logic behind that? By 1986, Sorry, please carry on. The, the world had reached the level of 70,000 nuclear weapons. I would take my students every summer for a special study abroad class in Hiroshima and Nagasaki every year from 1995 till COVID pandemic. Uh, and I, year after year, I'd find myself writing down <clears throat> the same information from the Atomic Bomb Museum in Hiroshima, that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bobs. How many times did we have to be able to kill everybody on the planet over before we're satisfied? Back in 1929, Sigmund Freud wrote a very poignant book called Civilization and Its Discontents, in which he <clears throat> elaborates on his idea of the death instinct. And we do have this homicidal tendency as a species. And we've got, most of us don't share that. Most people are peaceful and want to live together in peace and prosperity and want other people to share that also. But we have leaders who spend their time planning for nuclear war, effectively planning for annihilation. Uh, back in 1947, Lewis Mumford wrote an article titled, Gentlemen, You Are Mad, saying that these people who look like normal people but spend their time planning for extinction are madmen. And, and, and every country has them still. Uh, one solution to this is you said the world leaders getting together and thinking about the planet, coming together, sitting across the table and thinking about the planet instead of their nuclear weapons. However, that's not happening, but that's what world bodies like the United Nations were formulated to sort of check and balance. Do you think the UN also has lost that, lost that space to negotiate for world peace? Uh, sadly, it hasn't played that role well, if it ever played that role, it certainly hasn't played that role in recent years. And it's not because of the leadership of the United Nations. Guterres does share that vision. You know, and Guterres' comments about even the Middle East have been quite wise. I mean, he condemned the Hamas attack on Israel, but he said it didn't occur in a vacuum. And this has been decades and decades in the making. And we could, we, we must resolve this now. We need an immediate ceasefire. We need humanitarian aid getting in there. We need to figure out the basis for a two-state solution that allows the Palestinians to live in peace with some dignity and some, you look at the situation now in Gaza, even before this latest fighting, 80% of the people there lived in poverty 46% unemployment rate. What kind of conditions are those? The situation in the West Bank is, has also been miserable. We've seen the expansion of settlements, 700 attacks by Israeli settlers on Palestinian this year alone in the West Bank. You know, And the world has turned a blind eye to this. The United States, which provides so much aid to Israel, has had effectively until now abandoned the thought of uh, a two-state solution. Unless people have some hope, they're going to do terrible things like we saw, unconscionable, unimaginable things like we saw happen. Uh, and so let's begin to sit down. This is a way for the United States and China and Russia and India and others to work together. Let's, let's work together to bring some kind of peace to the Middle East. I mean, all, China, Russia have close ties to people on both sides and countries on both sides of this conflict. And let, let, let's use those diplomatic ties to begin to bring peace to that region. If we can do that, then maybe we can bring peace to Ukraine. We almost were there 
We almost were there before Russia invaded. We were almost there in March of 2022 after the invasion when they looked like they had an agreement. And then the Johnson, the British, and then the Americans urged uh, Zelensky to back off of that agreement. They said they're going to give them um, as much military and political support as he needs and financial support. And the, the agreement uh, dissolved. But it, we came close and we can get back to something along those lines. Yeah, well, let's let's hope for that. And uh, till then, uh, the nuclear Armageddon predictions, I hope your prophecies do not come true. I do. Um, believe me, I do too. Yes, and I hope that our leaders, world leaders, have better sense than that. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for sharing your views with our audience. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, viewers, for watching this broadcast. We will keep coming back to you with more. Stay tuned to Hindustan Times.